Hi everyone, welcome to the Teaching English webinar for teacher educators. My name is Shirin Soyuz and I'll be your moderator today. Thank you all so much for joining this live event. This webinar is about the role research and research-oriented publications might play in teachers' professional lives and in the development of their professional understandings. So as usual, before we start the session, I'd like to share a number of quick housekeeping reminders with you. While waiting, please share with us in the Q&A where you are from. If you work in pre-service teacher education, type pre-service. If you work in in-service, type in-service in the Q&A. This session is being recorded and a recording of the webinar will be available on the Teaching English website in the next couple of days. And the link to the certificate will be provided in the thank you email that you'll receive tomorrow. And you will have a chance to ask our presenter questions during the session, uh, but we use the Q&A to ask our presenter uh, our questions. So we'll be using the chat only for announcements. So please use the Q&A for your questions during the uh, session. Let me introduce our presenter, Graham Hall. Uh, is Professor of Applied Linguistics, TESOL at Northumbria University, UK, where he teaches on the university's MA Applied Linguistics for TESOL and MA TESOL programs. He is the author of Exploring English Language Teaching, Language in Action, which was the winner of the 2012 British Association for Applied Linguistics Book Prize. He also edited the Routledge Handbook of English Language Teaching, and was editor of ELT Journal for, for five years until 2017. His research interests range from classroom discourse and language teaching and methodology to the ways in which English language teachers understand their practice and the role research might play in their professional development. So um, welcome Graham and uh, over to you to start today's session. Thank you so much. Uh... Shirin, can I just check that uh, I've now shared the screen successfully? Yes. Oh, yes. that's great. Okay. Right then. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for uh, taking the time out of your busy days, wherever you are in the world, uh, to uh, to join this talk. Um, yes, as the introduction said, as Shirin said, um, we're going to focus on teachers' engagement with published research, what, how and why, and I'd like to thank the British Council for giving me this opportunity, alongside yourselves for coming along. Uh, it's quite a lot to cover, uh, so during the talk there'll be a couple of pauses where you can ask questions or ask me to recap information, and um, we can always uh, take it from there. So, uh, here we go. The talk, as you'd expect, first slide, this is what we're going to have a look at. I'll give you a bit of background to the topic. And then I'll, I'll try and outline uh, how we're going to proceed. Some of the talk today will have a look at the literature around uh, the links between research and practice. And we'll take some ideas from what's out there in terms of publication. And some of the talk will draw on my own research, which was funded by the British Council ELTRA uh, Research Grants. Uh, where I got the views of research interested teachers and teacher educators, people out there in the field, people actually teaching, to find out what they thought about reading research with a view to what we, me, you, teacher educators around the world, researchers, what me, we might learn from them. So there's two sources of information. The topics we're going to look at today are these, perhaps not too surprising. One of the questions in implicit in, in this talk is, do teachers engage with published research at all? Okay, so that's the first issue. What do we mean by reading research? What kind of publications do people read? Are we talking about those really dense papers where there's columns and data and all that stuff? Or are there other things teachers might read? We'll have a look at why teachers might read research, the kind of perceived benefits, and of course, as you can see here, the barriers to reading research that we all encounter. And then towards the end of the talk, the bits that I hope are particularly useful for yourselves uh, are possible ways ahead for teachers, researchers, and teacher educators when it comes to accessing research and perhaps thinking through the implications for classroom practice. We'll have a look at what teachers have told me that they're interested in, in terms of research topics. And we'll have a look at how we, you and I, if you're in teacher education, might connect research and practice. 
when working with teachers. And there'll be some final comments as you'd expect. So that's the lie of the land. Okay, a bit of background. So we're in a very, very broad field. I don't know how many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of English language teachers and researchers there are around the world, but there are plenty of them. Now, as we all kind of theoretically know, both researchers and teachers and teacher educators, in theory, we all share a common goal. That is, to read the quote out, to help students develop their second language skills in a more efficient and effective way. So in theory, teachers and researchers and teacher educators, we're all on the same page. We're all wanting the best for our students. However, and you'll be acquainted with this yourselves in your own professional context and the kind of things that teachers say and the kind of things that some researchers say. When we talk about the relationship between research and practice, there's loads of words and metaphors that imply some degree of problem in that relationship. We hear talk of the gap between research and practice, of divides between research and practice, of a dysfunctional and damaging relationship between research and practice. So despite the fact that everybody's supposed to be thinking in terms of just benefiting learners, this research practice relationship has been really problematized, hasn't it? You get people like Alan Maley and Petr Medjes saying ah, research and teaching, they're just different activities. There's no need for them to be linked. Never the twain shall meet. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, you get people like Amos Paran saying, actually, research and practice should be linked. We need to build a dialogue. So that's one perspective on the relationship between research and practice. And the other perspective, and I guess many of you out there have encountered this, I certainly have, is when it comes to research about language teaching and language learning, there's just so much of it. There's so much research that's published. And this leads to two issues. Who's actually reading all this stuff? And there's claims and counterclaims as to whether teachers actually read it at all. And if all this amount of research is published, how should you, how should I, how should teachers and teacher educators, how can we navigate all that? How can we actually work out what is relevant to ourselves? As Sandy Millen put it, how should teachers know what to read? So there's some background issues about the teacher, uh, researcher, teaching, research link. OK, but before we continue, and this is one of the issues when it comes to talking about research and language teaching, a quick caveat of reservation. Not all research and not all researchers necessarily are interested in practical implications. And that's OK, I think. We don't have to say that all research has to have implications. For teachers there are different forms of knowledge there are different purposes of researching all that said the kind of stuff we're going to talk about today the kind of research we're going to talk about today is that research which attempts to investigate and inform pedagogic practice whether implicitly and or explicitly and what we're going to try and do is have a look at the implications of this research that investigates and informs pedagogic practice what are the implications of this for teachers what do some teachers make of it all? What do they make of all this research? And how might you and I, if you're a teacher educator, how might we respond to these questions of all this research, which says it's got something to do with teaching? What are we to do? How might we use it with our teachers, our trainees? So, as I said in the beginning, some of the time we'll have a look at the ideas from the literature, but some of the time, We'll have a look at the information that, and the, the data that teachers themselves supplied to me in this uh, report, this uh, research project I did uh, with the British Council. And I'm sure the slides will be made available after the talk. That's the link. There's a report about research interested teachers and their views of the teacher of the teaching research uh, link that you can find on the British Council website. And in the project, what I did was I asked teachers these key questions. I asked teachers, English language teachers, to report what research they read in its original form and what research they read in kind of moderated or mediated forms, in summaries or in newsletters and so on and so forth. I asked teachers 
what they saw as the benefits of reading research and the barriers to research. And as we'll see at the end of this talk, I asked teachers what research would they like to read? I asked teachers in effect to set an agenda for research. And towards the end of this talk, we'll have a look at what teachers themselves reported being interested in and what they would like researchers to go off and research and feedback to them. What I did in my research, when I say I asked teachers, I got replies from almost 700 teachers in, around the world on a questionnaire, which I uh, launched online. I also interviewed 15 teachers from around the world. So when I refer to what teachers told me, I'm actually referring to teachers who report being generally positive about or interested in reading research. And as we'll see, the teachers that I spoke to when I was trying to find out about the teaching uh, and research link weren't uncritical about the relationship. They weren't teachers who said all research is good. They had all sorts of things to say. And what I thought was interesting in the project that I undertook, and I'll try and feed back today, is that teachers who are engaging in reading research have lessons that we can learn from. And that's what we'll try and look at later. OK, so here's on to the main topics of what we're going to discuss today. Question one. Do teachers engage with research and research findings at all? You'll have views about this, but this is what the literature says. Generally, people who've done projects like the project I undertook uh, with the British Council have surveyed teachers around the world and they found low levels of teacher engagement with research and research findings. And I'm sure in your experience, you probably think the same. You probably found teachers in AR research not so interested. However, in my global online survey, I found there are some research interested teachers out there. This is what I found. In my survey of about 700 teachers, I found almost half those 700 teachers said they re read research, you know, pretty often. Just over a third said they sometimes read research. And others said very rarely. Now, I'm not claiming this is a representative sample of all English language teachers all over the world. All I'm claiming is some teachers somewhere are interested in research. When we hear people talk about research and teaching, loads of people say, no, nah, teachers, they're just not interested. I think we have to be quite nuanced in that. Many teachers aren't particularly interested, but some teachers are interested in research. So my question is, what can we learn from those teachers? What do they do? What can they tell us as teacher educators? Question two, and again, I think this is a, an issue within the field. When we talk about teachers reading research, what actually do we mean? Are we talking about teachers going away and reading dense statistical analyses of experimental data, 15 page, 30,000 word articles, or are we talking about something different? So, within the literature, as Marsden and Kasperovich say, there's more to reading research than just reading research in its original form. There's blogs, there's newsletters, there's other forms of summary, and we'll look at those later in the talk. In my own project, which was, as I say, teachers who indicated they read about research, what I asked the, 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 the teachers to do, I said, could you list the two or three titles that you actually read, which are to do with research? Because I wanted to find out what teachers meant and what teachers read. And I got, as you can see there, 1,168 uh, names of journals, as it were, or of newsletters. And this is what people said. So it's slightly blurry, but you can say, when from the research interested teachers that I was talking to, almost 80%, when they were talking about reading research, they were talking about reading research in professional newsletters and magazines. For example, IA TEFL SIG newsletters, teacher association newsletters, magazines like English Teaching Professional. A similar number of teachers were accessing research via the internet through a blog 
or teacher education and development website in which the author summarizes or interprets other people's research, but it's not the original paper itself. Slightly fewer did actually read academic journals, ELT journal, language teaching research, TESOL quarterly. Some were reading about research in teacher education texts, mediated, moderated books, the kind of things that people like Jeremy Harmer and Scott Thornbury put together. They read the research and they formulate it and format it into a book that you and I might read. And about half the teachers reported uh, reading research in British Council research reports. So when we talk about reading research and teachers reading research, we're not talking only about reading ac academic journals. There's all these other things which are sources of information about research that we need to think about when we talk about how we as teacher educators might engage with research and with teachers. Question three. Again, you'll have your ideas about this, so I'll go through this relatively quickly. Why do teachers and teacher educators like yourselves, why do they read research? What are the perceived benefits? So from the literature, again, perhaps not too many surprises. One of the key themes that comes through from the literature, why do teachers read research, is this, isn't it? Teachers read research to support pedagogical decision making, those decisions we make about our teaching, particularly when issues are new to them. One of the themes that comes up when I talk to teachers and comes up in the, as we'll see later in this talk, is the shift we've all had to make in recent years to teaching online, whether that's because of the, uh, the development of new technologies or because of the push due to COVID when so many of us had to teach online. However, one of the interesting things in the literature is when it comes to pedagogical decision making and the links to research, the links are often indirect. It's not necessarily that we read research which says, and now you go and do this. It's, aha, these are the issues you might want to consider, which teachers then have to process for themselves. And we'll come to those ideas of how teachers might process ideas from research shortly. So links are often indirect, awareness rather than direct actions. Why else do teachers read research? What other benefits are there? Well, I think this second one is really important. It's the idea that reading research, whether that's formal journal articles or in SIG newsletters and summaries, it gives emotional support. It gives us confidence. For example, some years ago, myself and Guy Cook did some research into L1 use, own language use in the classroom. And we surveyed, you know, 1,500 teachers around the world. And we found that uh, first language use was very common. We found various uh, reasons why teachers did it. Feeding feedback from teachers who participate in the project was really interesting because not only did it give them ideas for how to use the learner's first language in the classroom, importantly, it gave them confidence that what they were doing was quite common, that they were not alone that they were part of a general trend within the field. It confirmed the value of their existing practices. So one of the reasons why teachers might find engaging with research useful is not only about the decisions they make for teaching and learning, it's about reassurance. Oh, I, oh, I do this. Hey, it must be OK. That kind of thing. And I think that's really important in our field, because often when we close the door to our classrooms, we're alone. And it's reading research gives us that sense of community. And of course, another reason why teachers read research is because it might be part of the job. Institutional pressures. But as you and I know already, institutional pressures, you need to read research teachers, are often not fully supported. And we'll come to that later in terms of time and cost. And some teachers read research as they undertake professional qualifications, whether that be the uh, degree level studies or whether that's part of the sort of CELTA and DELTA, particularly the DELTA uh, qualifications and so on and so forth. OK, sorry, it's a big data graph here. OK, uh, I've missed the key off. Apologies. The blue is agree and strongly agree and agree. The red is less positive. Disagree. OK, so I asked those 700 teachers why do you read research? And this is what we can see. The reasons that came through quite strongly are teachers should read research. Interestingly, the should emphasis. Lots of teachers who are engaged with reading research, they think it's part of the job. 
<laughs> some teachers think ah, it's quite enjoyable we can see quite a lot of blue here they agree or strongly agree and teachers who are interested in support reading research think it's good for professional development interestingly for me at least maybe not for yourselves uh there was less emphasis on the idea that reading research leads to promotion less emphasis on the idea that institutions want teachers to read research and we can see down the bottom here, strongly agree and agree with the idea that reading research provides confidence. OK, that's quite a lot of colour. We'll move on. Here we go. Barriers to reading research. Now, as teacher educators, I'm sure you've had these conversations. What stops teachers from reading research? What stops you and I from reading research in our environments? OK, within the literature, no surprises here. Uh, if research is published in publications which have a price, cost stops people from reading research. There's a lack of time. It's not part of the job description, is it, for teachers? You know, I, I'm not starting from a personally, I'm not starting from a point of view that teachers have to read research. If it's not part of the job, then it's not part of the job, but some may wish to. And when we have cost and time, we can link this to a lack of institutional support. So it's all very well, perhaps, for people in universities who are researchers to say, teachers, you need to read research. But if the support's not there, how is it going to happen? Within the literature, we know, don't we, if you've read a paper, if I read papers, we know that the language and terminology can be a barrier. OK, now this isn't to apportion blame. Researchers are researchers. They write for different audiences, different communities of practice. But the language, if teachers try to access it, the language of papers can be difficult. Within the literature, we find that some teachers are quite sceptical about the notion of educational research. Either it's too scientific. Oh, look at all those facts, look at those statistics. That's not about education, that's just stats. Or, on the other hand, the idea that can you really find out about what happens in the classroom through research? It's not scientific enough. There's a perception amongst teachers, isn't there? A perceived perception, and you might have experienced this, you might hold this yourselves, that lots of research is irrelevant to real world concerns. <laughs> I can see loads of thumbs up floating up through the screen at the moment. <laughs> OK, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with this, but. And also many people have expressed doubts, Petr Medjesh has expressed doubts, for example, about the motivations uh, for research. Are researchers really trying to help what goes on in the classroom? Or are they really trying to get publications for their own careers? That kind of thing. We hear that quite a lot. Another issue uh, that Petr Medjesh has raised, and this links back to the Sandy Millen point at the start of the talk, if there's all this research out there, it doesn't always say the same thing. It doesn't always reach the same conclusions. One paper might say this, another paper might say that. What's a teacher to do? How are we to navigate all these differences and all these nuances? So one of the difficulties teachers and teacher educators often face is that as we read a range of research, we might find contradictory conclusions. And what are we to make of that? And of course, some teachers just don't want to, and that's fair enough, I think. Okay. Very quickly, this is my data from the research project I've mentioned. When the 700 teachers who expressed an interest in research talked about the barriers, this is what they said. And you can see a lack of time was a massive factor in stopping people from read research. And cost was a big factor, time and cost. For the teachers I spoke to, perhaps because they were engaged in research and engaged in research with research publications themselves, they had less difficulty with the language and the terminology. It was cost and time. And very quickly before a quick pause, some qualitative data, too many graphs. Okay. A teacher from Malta, these the quotes on the screen at the moment were institutional issues. Okay, teachers from Malta, from India and Germany, teachers from Malta and India suggested that time, cost and fitting it into workload were barriers. Teachers just don't have time. They can't access it because there's no institutional support. I found this quote from a, a, a German teacher very interesting, though, and this is something as teacher educators we might want to think about. 
One common barrier to, for teachers reading research relates to the microculture of a particular school or a subset of teachers. If I'm a teacher who's interested in res reading research, but nobody else is, if nobody in the group reads research, and if there's no suggestion from managers that this would be a good thing for teachers to do, as an individual, I'm unlikely to, to read research. So I may have an interest, nobody else is interested, that stops me reading because, you know, I've got nobody to talk to. So one of the things we as teacher educators we might want to think about is how to generate micro cultures, how to develop micro cultures, how to develop not one person's interest in reading research, but a group of teachers to get a dynamic, to get a snowball effect for things to go forward. That's something for us to think about. And this screen's worth of uh, qualitative quotes are all about competing ideas and the idea there's too much information out there. The biggest problem is selecting the research that's relevant, a proliferation of ideas. Or a teacher from Japan, far more people out there writing about education than necessary. Finding anything for, of value is tedious. And I guess that's where ourselves as teacher educators come in. We have to start, perhaps, if we want to take reading research forward with our teachers, we have to start being the filter to help teachers, I guess, which is challenging. OK, I've really gone through that quite quickly. A quick pause. OK, so I'm going to I think it's John uh, or Sheeran. Take 30 seconds to think through the issues raised so far. What seems reasonable and unsurprising to you? Has anything been said that you didn't expect or that you disagreed with? Any comments or questions before we proceed? Have I said anything ludicrous that you think, ah, come on, Graham? Can you comment further on it? And um, I guess that you and you're there. If anything comes up in the in the question and answers box, uh, we can we can take it forward. Yes, yes. I would like to ask uh, two questions at that yes. stage. So one of them is uh, from Devender. Do you think that research reports gathered from one specific location are applicable in another place as well? I think that's a, I think that's a really interesting question, and we'll look at that a little bit more. I think there is the possibility they are applicable. However, I think the only people that really can decide whether a research a research report is applicable is those in the context. And as we go on in the talk, I've got a framework of questions we might want to ask ourselves as to whether a research set of research findings has anything relevant to me where I am now. So, so I think ultimately, I think the issue of reading research isn't so much about reading, it's more about thinking. As we'll see later, you can't, there's no point reading research unless you think about about the consequences. So reading and thinking go together. And that's why it, it comes within the field of, for teacher educators to consider. So so I've been really kind of uh, mealy mouthed and evasive in my answer. But yes, I think it could be, but teachers and teacher educators have to work that out in context as we'll see. Yes, so maybe in another context or reflecting yeah. in a different way. Celestin has a similar question. How reading research can affect pedagogical decision-making? Yeah. Now, again, um, I think I think for when we look at the kind of publications I listed, like English Teaching Professional or Teacher Association newsletters, they often try and be very practical and come up with very specific ideas for the classroom. So I think I think when we get to Teacher Association and ITEFL SIG newsletters, there's a big focus on practice that teachers can often read and take forward directly. The kind of the, the the higher we go up the chain, I don't like the word higher, but if we go to uh, research articles themselves, I think they require a lot more thought from teacher and teachers and teacher educators about implementation because I don't think they they address the the practice directly. And again, when I get to this slide towards the end of the talk about a framework for thinking, uh, that's something we can address. So I think different research publications have different levels of explicitness in the extent to which ideas can be taken forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more question yeah. from 
um, interesting findings and elsewhere reports relatively low as resource source. What might be done to make that kind of report more enjoyable, interesting for teachers, teacher trainers? <laughs> more enjoyable? <laughs> that's 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 a difficult question. I mean, I was very interested that that um, on one of the previous slides, quite a lot of the teachers who participate in my survey said said that reading research was enjoyable. Um, I uh, I think I think that again, I think reading research becomes more enjoyable if you have a chance to reflect on that research, and reflection is made more enjoyable by working with other people. I think it comes down to trying to make this a less isolated activity. I think it's very difficult to be sustained and to be motivated to read research if you feel you're just doing it yourself without somebody to bounce ideas off and without somebody to come along and say, oh, this, this one was interesting. What do you think of that? Oh, right. OK. A, a conversation with colleagues in your own context to understand research in your own ways, I think, is is the way to make it more sustainable and more enjoyable i think reading research reading research for its own sake i think is pointless uh you know i think it becomes interesting as a form of teacher development and for me teacher development is collaborative and working with people who have their own uh who, who share my, your own experiences and come at it from talking to people in the staff room and those sorts of things mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll come on to that shortly i hope okay so let's okay. continue let's continue yeah. questions so please keep writing your questions in the here we go thank you. thank you everybody for those questions they were really really good right okay so as part of the the project that i undertook as i mentioned i asked the participating teachers okay there's all this research out there which you kind of find more interesting or less interesting but if it was up to you if you could turn around to people who are engaged in research and say, this is what I'm interested in, this is what matters to me, what would you come up with? And I asked participating teachers to list up to three topics they would be interested in. And part of the reason for doing this was for, to, to develop, to start to develop a, a teacher led agenda for research into language teaching to kind of counter the idea that research is always decided by researchers. I wanted to know what teachers thought. So. The teachers in, in my project, they suggested they were interested in, and perhaps no surprises, language skills and structures. OK, that was a big theme that came through. What are you interested in, teachers? What do you want researchers to tell you about teaching language skills and structures? And actually, in the data that I collected, at least from my sample, there was much more emphasis on skills than structures. There were surprisingly few references to teaching grammar, actually. I thought there'd be loads of stuff about how do you teach grammar, but actually it's how do we develop our students' listening skills, our, their speaking skills, and so on and so forth. Another theme that came through from the in research interested teachers that I spoke to was this idea of classroom management. The teachers in my survey were really interested in how do you manage learner behaviour? How do we organise group activities and pair work? There were lots of references to underprivileged and special educational needs learners. There's quite a lot of reference to use of the own language, and quite a lot of reference to things like multilingualism and translanguaging. Now, it strikes me that in my knowledge of the, the field, there's not that much in terms of research into classroom management. And obviously ideas around special educational needs, learners and multilingualism, these have become, these are emerging topics in the field, I think. They've come about in the last, uh, I don't know, five, 10 years. So that's what teachers reported to me. Another theme, perhaps not surprisingly, the teachers in my survey said they were very interested in research into online technologies and technology mediated learning. And we can we all know the reasons for this. There was uh, interest in, in finding out how to deploy blended and distance learning. There was interested in specific apps, but there, it wasn't all accepting. What people wanted was evaluative research into what was effective and what wasn't effective. There were suggestions about other areas of practice. You know, you'll be familiar with these kind of things. Lots of the teachers of the 700 teachers in my survey were interested in testing and assessment. I thought this one was particularly interesting. There was lots of interest in the role of literature within the language teaching classroom. Now, 
I haven't done a geographical breakdown of where these responses came from, but if we have a look at some mainstream uh, areas of the literature, there's not actually that much about how we might use classic or canonical literature in the classroom. It's, it's almost an overlooked topic. And yet we know many classroom, in many classrooms around the world that you know the idea of teaching English through classical uh, literature and classical texts still exists. Lots of interest in intercultural communication, lots of interest in 21st century skills, lots of interest in how should we address plagiarism? Now, I did, I did my survey before uh, the, the panic around um, artificial intelligence and chat, chat bots and all the rest of it. So I'm sure this is an even stronger theme now. There was quite a lot of interest to express. We want to know more about learner motivation. And there was quite a lot of interest about teachers, about teachers working conditions, about teachers well-being and burnout and about we want to know more about teacher motivation, and demotivation. So from the 700 teachers who were interested in reading research, this is what they wanted to see research into. And I'd be interested to know whether this chimes with your views. Interestingly, other issues were mentioned, but not to a great extent. There wasn't a great deal of interest in second language acquisition research. There wasn't a great deal of interest in things to do with discourse and pragmatics. It was mentioned by one or two people, but not that many. The themes as you see them here on the screen were the big ones. Okay, so what can we, you and I as teacher educators do? So the suggestions that came through from the teachers in my survey were these. First of all, try and make research publications and findings more accessible to teachers. Now, what the points I'm about to put up really are, are for researchers and for publishers to consider. So we'll look at them very briefly because they're not things that I think we can affect. Can we affect physical availability and cost? Personally, I can't, but I can ask publishers to do that. Teachers suggested that the way research is written up needs to change. And that's something for researchers to think about. And teachers suggested they would like more input into the design and writing up of research. So they were all sensible suggestions, but perhaps not the focus for this talk today. What the teachers also suggested was making use of summaries, digests, collections, and freely available research publications. Yeah, that's common sense, isn't it? Forming reading communities. I've kind of mentioned that already and showing connection between research ideas and practice. So we'll look at these last three ideas because I think these link more to teacher education than the previous three. Okay, so there's a lot of screenshots about to follow. Here we go. Summaries, digests and accessible research. Now I'm just going to run through a few things. You may be aware of them, maybe not. If you're not, I hope they're useful. If you are, just bear with me. There are, in our field, directories of research that are freely available that you and I as teacher educators might be able to access and then be able to share or to filter for our trainees. There are research oriented Twitter uh, posts and blogs, which I, I use a lot actually. There's open access articles and journal articles and there's researchers own personal and institutional web pages. So what I've tried to do here is list four sources of research or summaries of research that are free. So here we go, directories of research. Maybe you know this, maybe not, but the British Council itself has directory of UK ELT research from 2005 to 2012. Okay, it's a little time ago, but there's masses of stuff here. Excuse me. <laughs> If you go to the uh, go to Google or whatever search engine you use, type in Directory of UK ELT Research for the British Council, it will take you to this page. And there are basically two or three books listing all the abstracts in teacher friendly language of recently published or pu research published in this period. It's a resource for us. It's a resource for us. There's also this resource, OASIS, Open Accessible Summaries in Language Studies. 
This is run from the University of York. And what it does, the team at the University of York are developing a database whereby, whereby they look at uh, language teaching publications and research, and they produce summaries, one paragraph summaries in a document. And what you can do is this. Here we go. You can sign up to their weekly email with links to all new summaries. Now that sounds very intimidating. What you can actually do is when you sign up, there's a filter where you tick the topics that are interesting. So for myself, I'm quite interested in multilingual classroom. I'm quite interested in teacher motivation. I'm personally not so interested in correctional feedback. So I didn't tick that box. So every week I get an email with a list of all the papers that the Oasis people think are relevant to the topics I select. I can click on the link that takes me to the summary and it tells me what the paper's about and it tells me what it's found. So for, I mean, I, I you know, for me, I think it's a fantastic resource. So that's Oasis, Open Accessible Summaries in Language Studies, one page descriptions of research articles on language learning, teaching and multilingual in peer reviewed journals. So you don't have to go to the journals yourself, you can get summaries. And if you then want to go to the journals, that's fine, but you can sign up here. Is Oasis summaries of the research for ex teaching English? I'll come back to that later, but it's, it's, it's language learning and teaching in general, but it has relevance to the teaching of English. There's research, so that, those are kind of research summaries. Myself, I do, I do, I lurk, I don't post very much, but I lurk on Twitter. Twitter's such a great resource. I know it's got its, its other side, but in terms of finding information about language teaching and learning, we can find, for example, for example, English language teaching research in action. And here we have a post by Jessica Mackay, who's, who summarizes all sorts of presentations. We can go to Facebook. There's lots of Facebook communities. There's the ITEFL Research SIG community and many, many others. And of course, there's blogs. So if you want to get to that tier of research summaries or mediation of research, I think the web's really terrific and it's free. Open access research. If you go up to that next tier of actual journal articles themselves, one of the issues that we all face is cost, isn't it? But journals do have open access papers, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, but just in case you're not, this is how it works. You go to a journal homepage. This is ELTJ, ELT Journal. If it has this little green sign, free, or a little unlocked padlock, it's a, it's a free click. So this paper is free, no cost implications. And usually these are labeled as editor's choice. But look for this sign on a journal homepage if you're looking for free, no cost papers. Similarly, if you want to know what a journal is publishing, get the alerts. Like the Oasis page, sorry, sign up to a weekly email. Most journals have an alert. Sign up to it, see what's coming out. It's free. It tells you what's out there. And then most people working in universities now are obliged to publish in journals, but also most people working in universities, most researchers put pre-publication pre drafts of their work or of much of their work on personal web pages. So for example, here we go. This is from uh, Willy Renandia, Renandia okay? His, his website's terrific. And what he's done, he's made all his, his papers open access. You can see here, if you click on his name, you get to read his article in the original. So if there's a researcher or somebody whose work you're interested in, try and find their personal web page, because a lot of the time you'll find a lot of free material. Somebody like me, there's a particularly awful photo of me. This is, I work at the University of Northumbria. I have a personal web page at Northumbria. Okay, and there you go. On it, there's open access. That's a pre-publication draft. So not everything is 
is accessible, but quite a lot of material that people like me write, you can find open access versions on personal web pages. It's really quite useful. Okay, one last thing before a pause. So we've talked about where you might find research and all the material about, but we've talked about how can we make this fun or how can we make this sustainable? And for me, it's about finding reading groups and reading communities. We somehow need to generate amongst teachers the sense that some research might be relevant to practice. And the way to do this, in my view, is we have to start with practice and then say what research might, might say about practice. There's no point in saying read research for the sake of it. For teachers, we're interested in practice. So this is a series of questions that I use with the people, the teachers I work with. I ask teachers, well, what do you do? What do you do now? And half the time, it takes a little bit of time for people to think this through. Then, what does this say about my assumptions? In effect, why do I do this? Why do I do what I do? That's question two. So far, no research. It's start, well, just about practice. And then, where do my ideas come from? Has research had any influence here? Directly by reading or indirectly via teacher education courses? So I tend to start with practice. What do I do? Why do I do it? Then, where do these ideas come from? Is there a role for research? And then getting into teacher education, teacher development, this question, what alternatives are there to what I do now? And in thinking through alternatives, this is where we might want to introduce the idea of research. So the earlier question was, does research undertaken in one context have implications elsewhere? Well, I don't think a researcher can really know, but I think this is the question. If we have a group of teachers thinking, what do we do? Why do we do it? Where did we learn this? What are the alternatives? That's where the local, the locality, the localness comes in. Because if I read research and it says, do this, it may offer an alternative, but the next question is, are the alternatives available? In other words, does research lead to more effective teaching and learning in my context? And I think that's a question that only teachers in the context with the assistance of teacher educators in the context can answer. And earlier I mentioned that reading research is a process of reading, but it's a process of thinking. So for me, these are the questions. When I ask my, my trainees to uh, read research, I don't really start with the research itself. I ask them with what they do. Oops, sorry. I ask them what they do. And then I say, what does research say you could do? And then I say, Yes, but is that research likely to work in your context? And I, I don't want to appear glib and I don't want to suggest that I'm oversimplifying. But to me, that's that's the essence of reading research. What do you do? What does research say you could do? Is that likely to work in your context? And that involves not only reading, it involves thinking. And to think that through by yourself is really challenging. But to think that through in a group or with a colleague, is less challenging. It's a dynamic. So the final element of trying to make research more accessible is this idea of reading groups. OK, I've got one more slide, which is a few conclusions, but a quick pause again for any further questions. What's reasonable? What's unsurprising? What have I said that you think is complete nonsense? What's not clear? What do you want me to revisit? over to yourselves very quickly. We have received really good questions and uh, we'll try to ask some of these. So we've again received few more comments on the applicable applicability of the research to different contexts. So especially the um, 
uh, teachers or teacher educators inability to apply research findings because of low resources. Would you like to say anything about this? Yeah, I think so. I think this this is this is the key issue, and this goes back. So I sort of hedged around it when it was first asked, but but this is this is with reference to my previous slide. I think one of the reasons why teachers and teacher educators dismiss research is because they think researchers don't know what's happening in my context. And I think um, unless research is very context specific and says this is what it this is what it means for your classroom here, because this is the classroom I research, I think that's true. So what I think the job of teacher educators is, is to recognize that research and research implications have limitations. And once we can get in our mind the idea that research might be interesting, but it might not be directly applicable, then we can start to be more critical. And for example, I, I, I do think that the idea of reading research, teachers, it's not that teachers need and teacher educators need low expectations of research, but realistic expectations. Research might offer a few ideas or a few principles. They can only be worked out and the implications can only be worked out by those in the classroom. Ultimately, what happens in the classroom uh, relies on teachers making decisions which work in their context. Now, I think it's therefore quite reasonable for somebody to look at research and go, that's a great idea in principle. But in my context, with 70 young learners in a classroom for one hour a week with low resources, that's not going to work. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for teachers to look at the possibilities that are being suggested by research and then go, yes, but that's not for me here because that's not going to work. And so the idea of applicability, the idea of whether something works in a specific context, I think can really only be taken forward by teachers. Now, that's I, I worry in saying that, that that places a lot of responsibility on teachers you know, and, and uh, there's something slightly unsatisfactory about the answer. Yeah. So uh, Salma has just posted it in, in one box that I've seen. Research are beneficial if it gives clues for teachers to follow. But the, the idea is clues. They're only clues. They're not uh, rules. There's a big difference. And if it's a clue for teachers to follow, teachers have to be free to go. Yeah, I can follow it so far. But no further, because in my context, the implications don't quite work out so i'm i'm guessing uh, my my main message is there's there's a there's a meeting point on the one hand research might make suggestions but they are only suggestions and own, and teachers and teacher educators will think through the relevance of these suggestions and whether they are practical in any particular context mm -hmm. okay thank you graham yeah we need to it's a hard ask because it involves a lot, it, it asks a lot of teachers because thinking's hard. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's kind of a different um, literacy, like yeah, it, and, 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 and but thinking becomes easier if we can do it with other people. Okay, and uh, we have also received lots of questions about the idea of should, for example, ah. Charmaine says, should research be required in schools? Uh, so. Um, should it be embedded in the school culture? Ah, if, if, if the question is, so if the question is, should teachers do research, as in should teachers do classroom research? I think that's my, there's a strong strand within, within language teaching at the moment and English language teaching in favour of practitioner research, in favour of action research and so on and so forth. And um, clearly, learning about and understanding your own classroom and trying to develop your practice is a good thing. However, I think, I personally, I think it's enough for teachers to think, it, I don't think there should be an obligation for teachers to do action research, personally. I just think that research uh, and action research are another thing. And if teachers, and for it to be successful, teachers have to want to, to follow that path. I do think teachers, whether formally through an explicit process, but we all do it anyway. I do think teachers need to reflect on what works and what doesn't. But we kind of do that as soon as a lesson's over, don't we? We've had a, we've had a lesson that really works. Well, hey, that, why did that work? If I have a lesson that wasn't so successful. You kind of try and work it out informally. Um, but uh, 
I so I do think teachers need to reflect on practice, whether that's the same as teachers should do classroom research. Personally, I think I think that's another thing that teachers, if they're interested, can do. But for me, you know, teachers have a lot to do already. I'm slightly mm -hmm. out of line with colleagues in the field, perhaps, but but I, I you know, no. <laughs> Yes, you're right in terms of the workload. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes the teachers um, make decisions based on their assumptions. Maybe it might give them uh, some evidence as well, but, but of course, it takes time. Well, well you see, that, that's the thing, isn't it? I think, I think when it comes to teachers and research, there's two possible pathways. You can either engage in action research or practitioner research or exploratory practice yourself and undertake research. Or you can find out what other people have already done and reflect on that. And I suppose the talk today is to find out what other people have said and then reflect on it. That's the kind of the theme of teacher education that I'm sort of trying to deal with today. What have, What's already out there and how relevant is that to me? Mm -hmm. um, and you also mentioned different kinds of activities about embedding research practice in schools. Uh, is it the teacher's job or teacher's educator's job? For example, you mentioned... Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that... I think that the less we ask... If teachers don't have a responsibility for development or don't have time in their workload, I think the less we ask of teachers in terms of trying to set up formal structures, the better, because I think teachers have so much to do. Uh, that said, I don't think teacher educators can really uh, make can really help teachers unless teachers are open to to trying to work together and collaborate. So I'm I, again, I'm hating. I, I'm trying to I'm trying to say that things things can only go forward if teachers want it to ha to happen and if they're motivated for it to happen. Uh, yeah. and, and to just say to teachers, you have to do this. I don't think that's going to work. Mm -hmm. I just think people have to be carried along and see the benefit themselves. <laughs> And people tend to see the benefit if they see others doing it and getting something out of it, which comes back to this idea of community. Uh, now, how to set up uh, communities of practice, communities of readers is, is a real challenge. Uh, and every context will have its own challenges. But I think without uh, both the formal structures of time, but also the informal structures of working with other people who are similarly interested. I think that's, you know, it's getting that kind of dynamic and getting people interested. Mm -hmm. That I think it's it's the intangible uh, that, that that's that's really important, uh, and it, it's the two things together, isn't it? That work, and I think as t as teacher educators, um, finding the, the formal structures of time and cost are things that teacher educators often can't deal with. But they're trying to get people motivated and involved. That's kind of the, the more that more the element that we 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 might want to uh, to think about and work upon. Yes, that's the biggest challenge. Oh, it's really. I, I, listen, it's it's easy for me to sit here and say this is what people have said, and I'm I'm really aware of the challenges around it. I, I wouldn't like to say this all has to be done, and it's it's easy. I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. It takes time, but thank you so much. Uh, and we uh, we have also shared your research in the um, chat. Yeah. Yes, this is extremely useful as well. This is, this is, I think I've just got like one minute for a final slide. So this is trying to bring it together for, for everybody. Uh, first of all, to, because I know we're going to run out of time. So I'll, first of all, I'll thank you for your time and thank you for your really good questions. Uh, and you'll see how much I've kind of hedged around the difficult issues of time and cost. But to me, what I've tried to say is there's clear evidence that many teachers, not the whole field, but many teachers do read research in some way. But when we talk about reading research, we know that teachers favour some kind of publications over others. Teachers are also, like the questions in this talk, focus on practicality. There are benefits to engage with published research. I think, I think you wouldn't be here in this talk if you didn't know that, but there are huge barriers. I've tried to report teachers' priorities as they were fed back to me, and they're all very practical. And towards the end of the talk, I've tried to find, show ways that you can identify or find summaries of research or research papers that are freely available. Possible sources of more accessible research, research findings and research oriented materials. And I guess just the questions for you at the end of this talk are, are these. To what extent does the kind of thing that I've said here align with your own thinking? Does it sound familiar? 
Does it sound different? Does it sound reasonable? Does it sound outlandish and unreasonable? I hope it sounds reasonable. But if there's things I've said that you disagree with, then that that's that's fine. Take that as something to react against and find your own way. Because I think for me, that's the centre of teacher development, teacher education. What what works for me in my context? And finally, if we think engaged research is useful for teachers, and it does remain an if. I'm not here to, to hector and persuade necessarily in what ways might we encourage and support teachers. And it is challenging. But as I say, I think there's issues to do with formal structures and the informal motivation development of, of getting people to have a little bit of momentum for themselves. And that's it. So thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Graham, once again, for sharing your expertise, your um, research findings. Um, so finally, we would like to thank also our participants for engaging with us um, with great questions. Um, so we hope you found the session useful and picked up some useful ideas to reflect in your uh, training sessions. And the re recording of the webinar will be available on Teaching English in the next couple of days. And don't forget to subscribe to our monthly newsletter for teacher educators. And our next webinar uh, in August will be about developing skills to enhance your career as a teacher educator. So it, it will be a panel um, about how to enhance your career as a teacher educator. So we very much hope to see you all again in our future sessions. And um, see you and goodbye.